Well, good evening everyone and welcome to Evening Prayers for the East Midlands Synod for the 7th of December. Our opening praise for Wednesday in, Lent, in Advent. O God, make speed to save us. O Lord, make haste to help us. We may not know when, but you are coming to us. Grace overflowing from your heart, O God. We may not know who, but our hope will be shared by the least likely people, friend of the poor. We may not know how, but your peace will transform our angry words into warm welcomes, our bitterness into cups of love, spirit of joy. Glory to the Father and to the Son and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now and shall be forever. Amen. And our psalm for Wednesday evenings during Advent is Psalm 17, reading from verses 1 to 8 and verse 15. Hear a just cause, O Lord. Attend to my cry. Give ear to my prayer from lips free of deceit. From you let my vindication come. Let your eyes see the right. If you try my heart, if you visit me by night, if you test me, you will find no wickedness in me. My mouth does not transgress. As for what others do, by the word of your lips I have avoided the ways of the violent. My steps have held fast to your paths, and my feet have not slipped. I call upon you, for you will answer me. O oh Lord, incline your ear to me, hear my words. Wondrously show your steadfast love, O oh Saviour of those who seek refuge from their adversary at your right hand. Guard me as an apple of the eye, hide me in the shadow of your wings. As for me, I shall behold your face in righteousness, and when I awake, I shall be satisfied, beholding your likeness. Amen. And our song tonight comes from Graham Kendrick, and it's Arise, Shine, Darkness Like a Shroud Covers the Earth. Thank you. 
And our New Testament reading this evening comes from Luke chapter 1, reading from verses 8 to 17. Once when Zachariah's division was on duty and he was serving as a priest before God, he was chosen by lot, according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. Then an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayers have been heard. Your wife, Elizabeth, will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and a delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to their Lord, their God, and he will go before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Amen. And we continue to use Sally Welsh's book, Sharing the Christmas Story, for our Advent Reflections. And Sally writes this. We're told that Zechariah belonged to the priestly order of Abijah. His wife was a descendant of Aaron and her name was Elizabeth. What we're not told is that every male descendant of Aaron was a priest and could serve in the temple in Jerusalem. By the time we get to Zechariah, the number of priests had probably reached 20,000. They were divided into groups, with each group of priests serving for about two weeks in every year. The tasks of the temple were likewise divided up, and lots were cast for every role. Twice a day, prayers and sacrifices were offered up on behalf of the Jewish people. Exodus 30, 7-8 tells us of, according to Moses' law, that Aaron must burn fragrant incense on the altar every morning when he tends the lamps. He must burn incense again when he lights the lamps at twilight, so that the incense will burn regularly before the Lord for the generations to come. The privilege of offering incense at the altar of the Lord in his house might come to a priest only once in their entire lifetime. Imagine the preparation that Zachariah would have undergone, the excitement, the nerves perhaps. In the morning he would have processed to the temple, watched by hundreds of worshippers. He would have entered into the inner sanctuary with two other priests, whose task it was to prepare the incense and the altar. But then they would have left, and Zechariah would have been there, alone, to offer prayers for the nation. We're not told what Zechariah prayed for. Might it have been a child? Possibly not. After all, his role was to pray not only on his own behalf, but also for all Jewish people. Possibly too, after many years without a child and being advanced in age, Zachariah might have felt that for Elizabeth to become pregnant was too unlikely a miracle even to pray for. But an angel appears, and the course of Zachariah's life is changed. The child of these two righteous people will be a joy and a delight for them, but he will also have the greater task, that of preparing his people for the Lord. We will explore later this week Zachariah's reaction to this momentous news. 
But one thing struck me when I was studying this passage before writing about it. It is a simple thing, but the greater wisdom is usually that, isn't it? You see, before he could hear the angel, Zachariah had to be prepared to listen. Before he could hear the messages sent from God to him, he had to be in God's house, open to God's word. Joan of Arc, the 15th century French woman, born into a peasant family who claimed to have heard voices of the Archangel Michael, St Margaret and St Catherine, urged her to join the fight against the English who ruled France at that time, supporting the uncrowned King Charles VII in his efforts in the Hundred Years' War. She was captured by the English and burnt at the stake in 1431 at the age of 19. In his famous play, St Joan, 1923, born George Bernard Shaw imagines a conversation between Charles and Joan. Charles says, Oh, your voices, your voices. Why don't those voices come to me? I am the king and you are not. Joan replies, They do come to you, but you do not hear them. You have not sat in the field in the evening listening for them. When the anglist bell rings, you cross yourself and have done with it. But if you prayed from your heart and listened to the thrilling of the bells in the air after they stop ringing, you would hear the voices as well as I do. Sometimes we do not hear God's voices because our ears are filled with no the noises of others. Sometimes because our hearts are filled with worry and anxiety, pain or suffering or grief. And sometimes, however, we don't hear God's voice because we simply don't take the time to stop and listen. And each evening there's a, a question to ponder and tonight's questions are, how often do you stop and listen, really listen, for the voice of God? And how might you make time to do so? Quite a poignant question. How often do we stop and really listen for God's voice? And what can we put in place in our life to give that space to hear him? And then Sally asks, when have you heard God's voice and how did it feel? And we can hear God's voice in many different ways, as we see in the Bible and through our own experience. We can experience God's word through a, a preacher. We could read it in the Bible. We can hear it in the friend's voice. And some people have a sense of God speaking to them in their heart or even an audible voice. Have you ever heard God speak to you? And how did that make you feel? Let us pray. Open our ears, Lord, to hear your voice. Open our minds to follow where you lead. Open our hands to serve you through our neighbours. Open my heart, open our hearts, Lord, to your love. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. And Wednesday evening's New Testament song is a song of light. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through him, and without him not one thing came into being. What has come into being in him was life and the life was the light of all people. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness did not overcome it. Amen. And an evening prayer for Advent from our good friend Tom Schumann. 
In the days to come, may we work to establish justice in all places of oppression. May we learn to set aside our differences, like little children on a playground meeting those who have just moved in. May we be awakened from our apathy to discover the wonder offered to us by those we do not recognise as family. Then we will find ourselves standing within the gates of your grace, approaching God. In the days to come, may we be alert to the opportunities we have to ha welcome stranger. May we keep our eyes open for the chances to offer, offer hope to the despairing. May we expect to find you in every person we meet, in every place we go. Then we will find ourselves standing within the gates of your love, babe of Bethlehem. In the days to come, may we discover that the fear has fled as your hope draws ever near. May we lie, lay aside the shadows of our doubts and put on the shawl of grace. May we go take all the weapons crafted from our fear, our anger, our regrets, and transform them into generous gifts of hope and life for all around us. And then we will find ourselves standing within the gates of your peace, spirit of gentleness. In the days to come, may we find ourselves standing within the gates of your heart, God in community, holy in one. Amen. And we continue with our prayers. Lord, we ask you to give us your blessing. To your church, we ask for holiness. And in the cycle of prayer for the East Midlands Synod, United Reformed Church, we ask for prayers for the, for the churches in Lincolnshire. We pray for their ministers and elders and members, for all those that they work alongside in sharing your love in practical ways and sharing the good news. And we pray, Lord, for our own churches represented by this congregation, that you would help us this Christmas to be beacons of light. To the world, Lord, we pray for peace. Peace for the Ukraine, for Yemen, for Ethiopia, Afghanistan, Israel and Palestine. We particularly pray for all those unable to practice their faith openly and who are forced to flee persecution. To the UK, we pray for justice. We pray for political and economic stability. And especially we would pray for relief and help for those worried about the cost of uh, rising cost in food and housing and heat and other essentials. Be with all those who work to help the most vulnerable in our society. And keep our families safe, Lord. We spray, pray especially for those who have heavy burdens to carry on their own, unbeknownst to anyone else, and for those living with complex family situations where there's a need for open dialogue and understanding and reconciliation. May this Christmas season be a chance for families to reach out to one another. And Lord, we ask that you would protect the weak in our society, especially the senior citizens and children and all who are vulnerable and bless all those who care for them and give them the resources that they need to keep going with that care. And Lord, we ask that you would heal the sick of ailments of every kind, including people who are living with chronic pain and other long-term conditions. Alongside those who suffer physically, we pray for those who struggle with their mental health. And we pray, Lord, for those for whom this is not a wonderful time of the year, but either because of loss of loved ones, or because of loneliness, or because of fear, or because of lack of finances, <coughs> Christmas is a hard time and is a burden. May they know something of the true meaning of Christmas, and may people reach out into them with love, we pray. 
and we pray for those who have asked for prayer from us. The Reverend Michael Forster and Jean Forster. The Reverend Graham and Vera Mascaris. The Reverend Jenny Mills as she recovers <coughs> from a hospital stay and waits now for an operation. To the Reverend Derek Hopkins, <coughs> who is also home from hospital and recovering. To the Reverend Solomon and Pauline Ahi Brown and for Paulina's father Kewaku. <coughs> Excuse me. For the Reverend Samuel and Evelyn Silingui and Evelyn's father Lapson. <coughs> for the Reverend Martin Ferris and for the Reverend Stanley Crane. And for Father Anne, Andy. <coughs> Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayers. And we continue to pray with Liz for her great nephew Ryan and for her daughter Emma and as she cares for Leon, her son. With Prince for Cheryl, with Andy for Mike, his dad. <coughs> with Alison and Paul for Pat. Lord, bring your healing. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. And we pray for all those who grieve the passing of loved ones, especially at this time. For those who grieve for Bridget Mawara, especially her brother, the Reverend George Mawara, and her family. For those who grieve for Sylvia Fulton, especially Charlotte and Martin and Steve and Diane. And for those who grieve for Keys Maxey, especially the Reverend Ruth Maxey, his daughter and family. <coughs> Lord, as we offer up these names, some known to us, some not, we ask that your will be done in the name of your precious Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord and Saviour, who taught us to pray. Our Father in heaven, <coughs> hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread and forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from a time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. So may the Lord bless us with his grace and fill us with his peace. Amen. Good night and God bless and I will see you in a couple of weeks because I'm on holiday for a few days from Friday. So God bless and see you soon. <laughs>